Hello and welcome to Maths on the Move, the podcast from plus.maths.org. I'm Marianne Freiberger. We recently had the pleasure to meet Ekaterina Eremenko, who is a filmmaker and a mathematician. And we met her at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, where her new documentary called Solving the Bonnet Problem was premiered. Now, the film literally tells the story of a very hard maths problem being solved by a team of mathematicians. And Ekaterina was able to capture this because she was embedded alongside those mathematicians in a maths department. So the film really captures this exciting and dynamic and dramatic process of solving a complicated mathematical problem. It's a bit like a detective story, and it's really exciting to see that captured on film. Now, this reminded us of other times when we've been able to see people bringing the dramatic nature of mathematics to life in different ways. So we've decided to make a little mini-series of podcasts where we'll be revisiting past interviews with actors, mathematicians and directors about bringing mathematics to life on stage and on film. In the first episode of this mini-series, we meet the actress and mathematician Victoria Gould. My colleague Rachel Thomas interviewed her in a noisy cafe in Brighton in 2008, when Victoria was working on an innovative play called A Disappearing Number with the theatre company Complicité. Now, Victoria has interesting parallel careers. She's well known as an actor on stage and TV, including a two-year stint on EastEnders. What is less well known is that she's got a lifelong passion for mathematics and that she's even worked as a research mathematician. Now, in her interview, Rachel started off by asking her how these two interesting interwoven career paths came about. Um, well, I've always known that I wanted to be an actor, and, uh, and I've always loved maths. So I kind of felt like I had two brains, really. So I knew from uh, being a child that I, I was an actor, and that I needed to do that. Um, but I also loved maths and patterns. So at school, I was quite sort of pushed into the arts, um, and I used to secretly go into <laughs> bookshops and, and read maths books when I should have been studying for my A-level arts subjects. Um, and it felt a bit like a guilty secret that I, I was so interested in maths and that I found it very comforting. I ran a theatre company when I left school and continued my secret reading of maths books <laughs> in a furtive way uh, until I suddenly it kind of came out in my late teens, early 20s and went off and did um, maths, physics and engineering A-level in a year and went and did a degree in, in physics at Manchester University which has got a fantastic drama department so I had this wonderful three years of being in the physics department in the day and being you know, tutored by great astr the Astronomer Royal and going to Jodrell Bank and doing great experiments and then in evenings re uh, rehearsing plays I think I did ten plays in my first year at university which <laughs> and since then I've managed to, to act and, and keep up my interest in, in, in mathematics On the face of things that seems quite different to be interested in acting and to be interested in mathematics what was it about each of those two things that attracted you to them? It's much easier to tell you what attracts me to mathematics actually um, I love the, the assurance of maths. I find it tremendously comforting. And I love the patterns. And I love the consistency. I get a tremendous thrill out of, out of solving an equation or, or going through a proof. <laughs> it, I find it really... I use the word assurance. I think it's very reassuring. Um, and I love acting because I like telling stories. I enjoy telling stories and I really enjoy pretending to be somebody else. I think, um, I think a lot of actors will tell you that actually, that um, I, I think I'm essentially quite, quite shy, which sounds hard to believe, but if I'm pretending to be someone else, I find that very liberating and, and exciting. What were the differences between those two things as, as well? I think the, the problem, which any actor will tell you of being an actor, is that you are always living on somebody else's estimation of what you're doing. Um, so you are at the mercy of, of, of the last person who either saw your work or, or gave you a job. Whereas in mathematics, the mathematics is there and it's always right and it's solid. And it's. Um, I read a fantastic description of, of mathematics while researching this, this play, um, which was that the, the mathematical definition of maths is it's the set of all possible self-consistent structures. And uh, I find that that's a, a marvellous way of working, is in, in, in consistency. Mm -hmm. 
So you originally at school were doing uh, pursuing arts with mathematics as a as a secret passion, <laughs> and you went on to start a theatre company after school. Yeah, I. Uh, I formed a company when I left school called the Kangaroo Club. It was in the early 80s and there was quite a lot of, of public money around for, for arts projects. And we formed a, a very small company originally of five of us and we, we toured a play around, around London called Class Enemy. It's loosely sort of political theatre. <laughs> and we then advertised for, for more members um, in Time Out and we got a quite a large cast, I think about 15 of us, and we devised a show. It was in the early 80s when there was a, the new romantic movement was all very exciting and we a lot of us went to clubs and we did a devised show about nightclubs which we then performed in the nightclubs themselves so we were kind of part of that sort of Steve Strange kind of scene and it was hugely successful it was and great fun and we managed to pay ourselves a little bit I, I suppose now looking at the work I do with Complicity it was interesting that I was into sort of div- devised theatre at such a such an early point in my career did you realise that you could do both of these things when you were at university and you were doing the drama? That was, I mean, that was the first time both sides of my, my interest came together. Did you go straight from your um, Bachelor of Science to a postgraduate degree? Yes, I did. I didn't want to stop. Uh, I knew that I really ultimately wanted to act, but I didn't want to stop uh, doing maths and physics, really. So I went and did um, a Master's in uh, Applicable Mathematics, it was called, at Cranfield which was then Cranfield Institute of Technology, it's now Cranfield University. I did my master's on um, the use of fractals in generating landscapes, using, using fractals to create natural looking landscapes in computer imaging and image processing. So you, you began in a theatre career and then you took a side road and did a physics and then a mathematics degree. Where did you go next? And I went to Cambridge and worked um, for Marconi's Maritime Applied Research Laboratory. Did some very interesting work on sonar image processing, looking, trying to automatically look for wrecks in, on the seabed. And it's, again, kind of the early days of pattern recognition. Um, and I was there for about a year and a half until that particular research lab was closed down and I then went to King's College London and worked in the physics department there on synthetic aperture radar. Sorry what's synthetic aperture radar? Oh it's (laughs) if you've got a a transponder under a under a a helicopter basically looking for for patterns you can instead of actually having a real aperture if you put a a time delay on the signal you can create a synthetic aperture so it's apparently come from two different places to create a more realistic image. After some experience working in research uh, groups, where did you go next? I had a baby. <laughs> I went to Brighton with my baby. Um, and when she was uh, just about a year, I had a, did some research at, at Sussex University. I went back into research for a while. And I was working in the engineering department there, looking at modelling the weather, again on computers, and was loosely signal processing as well. And in the middle of that was offered a I was offered a part in, in Hamlet in the West End by somebody I'd been at university with who was, a, who was directing and I'd worked a lot with her. Uh, and I juggled the two for a little while with the baby, doing the, doing the research in the day and doing Hamlet in the evening in, in Covent Garden um, and realised actually that was too much. Uh, so I so gave up the research and from there I got, um, I got seen by, by a producer who asked me to audition for EastEnders. Um, and I was given the part of Polly, the journalist in EastEnders. So I was kind of catapulted into a slightly weird world of soap, land and infamy for a couple of years. So I, I played, played Polly for two years, uh, which was extraordinary because of the kind of public intrusion and the really odd stuff that goes on. In, I mean, people really believe that those soaps are real and people actually believe that I, I was Polly from EastEnders. Earlier we were speaking about the idea of there being a mathematical reality and you were just saying that your other work yeah. is creating another type of reality that some people believe in. I mean, does it sometimes feel like that? Yes, that's <laughs> a really interesting question. I, I grapple with reality all the time, actually, um, and because I think a lot about about space and dimension and where we actually are and, mm. well, yes, what's real and what isn't. Yeah. Dolus work with kids on the idea of for instance, if you're talking to someone, your friend on the mobile phone, where is that conversation taking place? Um, is it in, in your head or their head or 
somewhere in space or in the telephone or and you know when when you're talking to someone on the internet where is the internet where is facebook we're, we're quite used to those things happening in dimensions that we don't actually aren't aware of in a kind of cartesian sense so, so do you think maybe because we're being getting so used to thinking in virtual dimensions maybe that's softening us up for the idea of extra dimensions to space and time. I think you're absolutely right. I think it is. I mean, it was unthinkable when I was a teenager that there were any more than three dimensions, but, I mean, now we're quite comfortable with the idea that... I mean, we probably need 24, don't we, for for string theory, apparently. And, uh, yeah, I I think you're quite right. I think we are being softened up for the fact that there there probably are an awful lot more and that they actually exist and we need them. So you went from theatre to quite an intensive period of mathematics study and research and then thrown into um, theatre and acting again with your time um, in the play and in EastEnders. Have you managed to reconcile the two? Yeah, I mean, there's, I now have a, a quite a nice balance, I think, in my life. Um, I have a, a, an agent and I act um, as much as I can. <laughs> I do a great deal of theatre work and developing new writing. But I also... Um, do some supply teaching, uh, teaching mathematics, and I read as much mathematics as I can. And I also help children one to one with with their maths, which I hugely enjoy. And uh, recently, I've been involved with this fantastic project with Complicity, which has really brought the two halves of my life completely together. Because we were looking at some really quite r- rigorous mathematical ideas but to make a play, uh, which was absolutely fantastic and really exciting. Can you tell us a bit about the play? Well, it it started as a as, as many wonderful things have as an idea in Simon McBurney's fantastic head. He was given a book by his friend Michael Andarchi, who's a, who's a brilliant poet, um, called A Mathematician's Apology, which was G.H. Hardy's kind of... This one song, I suppose, the book he wrote um, towards the end of his career, wrestling with what mathematics was and what it meant to him and how real it was. Um, and it's a very, very beautiful book, and it... One of the that deals a lot with his collaboration with Srinivasa Ramanujan, who is a uh, an Indian mathematician. It has a very beautiful foreword by C.P. Snow, which describes the day when G.H. Hardy received the letters from Ramanujan. It's a very beautiful story about Ramanujan coming coming to to Cambridge and collaborating with Hardy, and that was the really the kernel of the play um, that Simon wanted to wanted to make. Um, and we spent really a couple of years exploring it and devising it and. And we kind of teased out this extraordinary show. Can you tell me a bit about your work with these workshops with students, both to do with the show and and outside of the show, where you're using a mix of theatre and mathematics to explore a number of things, I suppose? Yeah, this is this has kind of come about partly through through working as a maths teacher, but also as an actor. Um, and and really on the back of the show, we've worked we've been working with groups of people of all ages, groups of um, adult teachers, t- mathematics teachers and drama teachers, usually together in a, in the same room, with groups of A level students in England and in India, uh, groups of primary school children from year three upwards, and we've just been looking really at ways in which a group of people can collaborate together in the same way that a theatre company does. Mm. A group of people can kind of explore physically mathematical themes, uh, physically and emotionally. I mean, in, in, in creating a piece of theatre, one uses all sorts of what we call provocations to spark bits of story or bits of cr- creativity. And we've just been looking at the idea of using mathematical provocations, some very complex, like Irrationality Group 2 or or um, convergent and divergent series, some very simple as the, as the ideas of multiples and factors. Could you give us an example of one of the provocations that you might use? I mean, we, we, do, we do all sorts of things. Some, some are very um, kind of open. So again, I mean, I keep talking about it, but we'll perhaps with slightly older students, we'll expose them to the proof of the irrationality of Route 2. And some of them will completely get it and some of them will be very frightened and some of them will think it's a very beautiful pattern but you know, different, we'll have different but we'll ask them to use that as as a, a provocation to make a, a, create something um, but the other thing we do is is really quite specifically use um, 
simple mathematical ideas in, in movement. So we might quite specifically use something like partitions to actually choreograph a piece of theatre. And what we would then do would be introduce the group to the idea of partitioning a number into the additive sum of its components. Um, and we might look at the partitions of, of two and three and four and then ask them to go away in groups and physically embody their partitions of five, explore how many there are, um, and then perhaps show them to the group just in terms of physical bodies and how you, how you can partition people. Um, and we then perhaps ask them to create a simple narrative that will show all those partitions. Um, and then we would ask them to perhaps take that further and say, create a small piece of theatre based... We usually do either in a restaurant or on a train, but which is a narrative um, with words usually, uh, which actually tells a story but where you have to be able to see all the partitions of five, for instance. Um, and, you know, I'm quite rigorous about saying I'm, I'm looking for them all and we've got to see them all. But you'll find you've, you've very quickly produced a scene in which if you didn't know you were looking for the partitions of five, you would... Think. And it's, it's a lovely way, actually, of, of getting to people to get out of their heads the idea of performing or of having to instantly create a fantastic character, but just actually using the maths as a way of, of focusing and being in the space. And it's extraordinary. I also quite often get do exercises with, with actors where perhaps you'll ask them to enter a room sit on a chair get off the chair and leave the room at, with, in front of an audience and try and just get them to be and that's often quite difficult but if you then s- secretly say to them I want you to enter the space in 7 sit down in 11 and leave in 5 and you'll ask the audience what the difference in those two performances is. It's extraordinary that they will say the second one, they were much more present and much more relaxed and much more real. And it's something to do with, if you're actually counting in your head, you are more present and, more and less self-conscious. And so we use that, those kind of ideas quite a lot. Um, and then with smaller children, I mean, and actually no, also with adults, but we do quite a lot of work on, for instance, I told you the story about, about actually in panic one day, throwing us, my keys into the middle of a of a studio space and saying I'd like everyone to enter the room and in silence sit down so they're all in equal distance from the keys um, and use that as an idea of introducing loci and circles and sets, sets um, shapes that have an incredibly simple rule and we also do another one where um, which is marvellous actually <laughs> for movement which is where you say I'd like everyone in the room to secretly choose two other people don't let them know and then when I say go make yourself into an equilateral triangle with those two other people. And of course you create this fantastically chaotic movement because people don't know who the other people are. And it's a, it's a lovely way of making a very natural looking movement. And it's, it's another example of a, of a really, really simple rule creating very chaotic behaviour. One of the things that struck me at the beginning of the play, it begins with a, with a lecture, essentially. One of the characters giving a, ne- a lecture um, on the Riemann's interfunction, and I was struck that maths lectures are a performance. Yeah. And uh, I guess I wanted to ask: Do you find you must find that your theatre training adds to your ability to teach and to p- convey mathematical ideas? And do you find your mathematical training has some input into your theatre as well? Yes, I think that I both are very much informed and helped by each other. And I think you're right. I think. Um, teaching is is a performing mm. skill mm. Um, it's a performing job and a lot of the techniques for, for teaching a, a large class are um, very rooted in in theatrical training like the idea of stillness being much more powerful than than a lot of chaotic movement for instance um, comes very much from from theatre and mm. um, and that you know ex- expecting and being very cal- expecting good behavior by by one's own calmness um, is much more powerful in terms of, of discipline in a classroom. Um, and also I find, yes, I do approach making theatre in quite a mathematical way, actually. And I, I, I have to plan quite carefully. Gonna do and, and, oh, but also I kind of, when either of, particularly when, when teaching or acting becomes kind of stressful, I, I retreat to maths uh, a lot for its, yeah, for its calmness and its patterns. So mathematics is stress relief? <laughs> Absolutely, without a doubt. Every time, it's the be- it works every time. <laughs> so, do you hope to continue on this parallel career in mathematics and theatre? I feel I have no option, actually. I, I it, it, 
there have been various times in my life where I've done one without the other and it doesn't work my brain needs to be doing both um, sometimes I've got very I won't say bogged down but in mathematical research and not done theatre and I, 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 you know, I need to do some theatre and, and vice versa I mean I have to keep doing maths so yeah it feels more I don't really have a choice but um, yeah I mean I've been incredibly lucky to be able to not only pursue both of those things but actually to bring them together in the work that I've done recently so I'm extremely lucky <laughs> Stay tuned for next week's episode when Victoria Gould alongside Marcus de Sotoy talk about the mathematical nature of Complicité's play, A Disappearing Number. You can read more about Victoria's career and about the play by going to plus.maths.org and searching for Victoria Gould and A Disappearing Number. We have also put those links in the episode notes. Thanks for listening and bye for now.